Hey, it's Dr. Jamie. My pronouns are she or they. I'm an associate clinical professor of psychiatry. I am a researcher and I'm somebody who works in the space of gender affirming care. Welcome back to my channel. So I prepared this presentation today after one of my viewers reached out to me and informed me that they knew a transgender woman who was involuntarily hospitalized in a psychiatric institution was taken off hormones and was housed with male identifying individuals. So needless to say, that is very disturbing to hear. It is not in line with best practices or the law. So what I am sharing with you today is actually a modified presentation that I give to psychiatric residents with regard to the care for transgender people when they need acute psychiatric hospitalization. The same would apply for a transgender individual who would be admitted, for example, to an inpatient hospital floor. So the uh, name of the presentation is Acute Hospitalization of the Transgender Patient. So this will be a case presentation. So I will read through the case. There'll be some questions and um, I will also give commentary and references at the end. This presentation is good for lay people, for residents, for medical students, and for attending physicians who may not understand or have little understanding in the care of the transgender patient. So this case is a case of worsening depression. Mrs. S, a transgender woman, age 44, is brought to the emergency room by a friend for worsening depression, paranoia, and suicidal ideation. She has a history of major depressive disorder and gender dysphoria. Her friend says Miss S got like this one time before when she stopped her psychiatric medicines. Miss S is admitted to the psychiatric unit for evaluation and stabilization. Okay, so a little more history. So Miss S receives medical and psychiatric care from a community clinic. According to their records, Miss S was assigned a new prescriber three months ago. She attended one appointment and missed her next two scheduled appointments. On the phone, the prescriber referred to the patient as Mr. S and when corrected stated, oh yes, he's a trans man, right? The patient tried to explain it to me. I don't get the whole transsexual thing. So the first question is, what did Mrs. S's provider get wrong? How could this have contributed to Mrs. S Mrs. S's non-adherence. So I put in bold some of the things that the new prescriber said that um, were inaccurate. So on the phone, the prescriber referred to the patient as Mr. S. As we know, Mrs. S identifies as a woman. And so her honorifics are Mrs., not Mr. And when corrected, had stated that, oh yes, he's a trans man, right? So not only did the prescriber refer to Miss S with the wrong pronouns, her pronouns being she, her, he incorrectly labels her as a trans man because he doesn't understand the language. So as you can imagine, if you are a patient and you are meeting a new prescriber, and this is what you are hearing coming out of that prescriber's mouth. Will you want to go back? So this is a point of uh, that if you are a medical student, a resident, somebody caring for a transgender patient, make sure you ask what their honorifics are. Make sure you ask what their pronouns are. Make sure you ask what their preferred name is. This is very important, especially if you have any questions, because not sometimes Gender identity is not always apparent. Gender identity does not always match gender expression. So if you have any question, which again, you can never be certain what someone's gender identity is, ask. A good way to do this is to actually introduce oneself with your own pronoun. So for example, my name is Dr. Agapov. I use she or they pronouns. How may I address you? Okay. 
The other thing that this provider uses is the term transsexual. Now it is true that some individuals may still identify with these older terms, but not everyone does. And unless a person actually refers to themselves with these terms, a provider should not use outdated terms like transsexual. The proper term is transgender and it is not a noun. <laughs> so it's like a transgender person, okay? All right. So here are some author observations. So transgender people often report a lack of gender competence from healthcare providers. They may be misgendered or face over discrimination. Providers may use outdated language or diagnostic terms that pathologize gender identity or are now considered pejorative by a majority of the transgender community, such as transsexual. In many cases, transgender people must teach their healthcare providers about their own care. Many feel unsafe in the healthcare setting and may avoid it, as Mrs. S did. As a result, transgender people often experience an increase in healthcare disparities and negative health outcomes. All right. So Mrs. S is in the psychiatric unit. In the psychiatric unit, the, her medicines are reconciled. So basically the, the team is looking over medicines to see what she's on. They include fluoxetine 60 milligrams daily, which is an antidepressant, aripiprazole 10 milligrams daily, which is an augmenting medicine used to treat depression, propranolol 40 milligrams daily, metformin 1000 milligrams daily, Lisinopril 20 milligrams daily and transdermal estradiol 0.2 milligrams daily. Ms. S becomes upset when she is not offered her transdermal estradiol with her oral medicines. So here is the question. For transgender patients, what should be done with their hormone prescriptions upon admission? A. Discontinued. B. Continued. C. Administered at half the outpatient dose or D, held until hormone levels are determined? So the correct answer here is B, hormones should be continued for patients admitted to inpatient medical and psychiatric units. Okay, I'm gonna repeat it again. Hormones should be continued for patients admitted to inpatient medical or psychiatric units. A is incorrect. Hormones should not be discontinued unless they are the cause of a medical complication i.e. thromboembolism, polycythemia, etc. C is also incorrect. There is no evidence that lowering hormone doses during admission is of any benefit for any reason. Continue prescribing hormones at the outpatient doses. D is also incorrect. Hormones do not need to be held while hormone levels are determined. Hormones can be restarted and hormone levels drawn if needed, if indicated. Okay, author's observations. No evidence supports the routine discontinuation of hormones upon hospital admission. Gender affirming hormones are safe and effective in transgender persons with coexisting gender dysphoria and psychosis or psychotic symptoms. Additionally, they are shown to improve anxiety and depression symptoms and improve quality of life. This is really important. Regardless of why the patient is being admitted, Ms. S had depression with some paranoia. Even if Ms. Had, Ms. S had bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, you would still continue her hormones unless explicitly contraindicated. Freeze frame approaches that maintain hormones at low initiation doses and or discontinue them have been associated with depression suicidality, and or genital self-injury in institutionalized persons. This has been seen especially in the prison population. In the hospital setting, these approaches could lead to worsening psychiatric conditions and or an increased length of hospital stay. You know, that's like the last thing that we want. So let's go on with the case. So overnight, staff report Ms. S is agitated and refuses to stay in her room. As needed, anxiolytics are offered but declined, and, re and reevaluation is requested by the on call physician. On the unit, Miss S is observed pacing the common area. 
When asked what is the matter, she replies, there is a man in my room, I do not feel safe. Admission records show a male patient was placed with Mrs. S in her room during the evening shift. When asked why this occurred, the staff reports that Mrs. S's legal sex is, quote, male. So here's the question. How should room assignments be based for transgender persons admitted to the hospital? A, sex assigned at birth. B, legal sex. C, identified gender. And D, only with other transgender persons. So the answer is C. Room assignment should be based on patient comfort and safety. In circumstances where discriminatory policies exist, single occupancy rooms are a reasonable alternative. So just to be clear, when you have a transgender patient who's admitted to the hospital, they should be roomed based on their gender identity, not their sex assigned at birth, not their legal sex, or not based on the fact that they're transgender, based on their gender identity. What is the rationale behind this? The Affordable Care Act prohibits discrimination based on gender identity, such as not providing room assignments and access to restrooms consistent with gender identity. This is in line with the recommendations of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health and other organizations who recommend healthcare professionals respect and accommodate transgender persons in these settings. Best practice guides have been created to help hospitals create inclusive environments for the care of transgender patients that align with non-discrimination laws and mandates. So if you're a patient that has been roomed with individuals that don't align with your gender identity and you have felt unsafe, you should maybe seek legal guidance. Conclusions. Unless specifically contraindicated, a transgender patient's gender-affirming hormones should be continued at the time of hospital admission. Healthcare professionals should respect transgender persons by using their identified name and pronouns and providing access to rooming assignments and restrooms based on a patient's choice and safety. Hospitals should develop gender-inclusive guidelines and policies that align with regulatory non-discrimination laws and mandates. So when you look at the standards of CARE 8 from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, it very clearly states that hormone treatment has been shown to improve quality of life and decrease depression and anxiety. Access to gender-affirming medical treatment is associated with a substantial reduction in the risk of suicide attempts. And removing hormones, even during hospitalization, may worsen underlying psychiatric conditions and result in prolonged hospital stays. These are my references. Joni? I hope this was helpful.